and welcome to this, where I'm going to talk to you about how I engage the public using edible insects to talk about important topics like human evolution and the problems of ethnocentrism and the importance of sustainable agriculture. My name is Julie Lesnick. I'm a biological anthropologist who studies the evolution of the human diet, and I primarily focus on the role of termites. I started this work in about 2006. But in 2013, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization put out a monograph, over 200 pages, arguing why we should use edible insects as an alternative for our traditionally raised livestock. And so it was at this point that I realized that I'd heard this before. I'd, of course, come across people saying this on the internet. And I had thought they were crazy when I was working on my dissertation. But by the time 2013 rolled around, I'd been working on this for six years. And I realized that the nutritional value of edible insects could not be avoided. Could not, you can't argue that insects are not a nutritional food source. And so I realized that I had a lot that I could offer this conversation. I looked at the statement, and the authors of it were entomologists and agriculturalists or agriculturologists or people that study agriculture. And there are no social scientists. And so I realized that there was a lot of important things that I could bring to this about cultural worldviews, that the disgust here in the United States is not the same around the world. People eat bugs everywhere, and that we have these views because of our own history. And so I knew that I could contribute to this conversation. So my foray into outreach really started with talking to other scientists. I talked to these entomologists and these agricultural scientists and tried to impart in them that the value of sort of the humanities and the social science perspective. And so that's one of my points that I want to start with is that other scientists are still public engagement, talking outside of our specialty. Whether we like it or not, academics were a part of a society. And so we can talk to other academics outside of our field, and that's still engaging people with our work. And then from there, I then started talking to environmental activists, people who are really smart and care about the planet. And so I realized talking to them wasn't actually much different than talking to other scientists. And then from there, now people just are excited about edible insects. People just want to know more about it. And so I talked to a wide range of people, and it's all the same. You just kind of use common language, talk to people like they're people, and it goes a long way. And so what I'm going to talk about here is how I, how I engage people, some of my tips and tricks. I have a website. I have a blog. I have social media, but there are people that do that a lot better than I do. I use that, though, to make sure I have a web presence so people can find me. And then they invite me to go give talks. And so all of my tips and tricks are really about giving talks. How can we communicate to the public in different sorts of public speaking engagements? So Julie's tips for public engagement. Tips and trick number one, use bad graphics. Case in point. So I argue for using bad graphics for a couple of reasons. If you can create beautiful graphics, do it. But there's some really good reasons why you should use bad graphics. One, they shouldn't take much time to put together. You're not looking for perfection, and so you can cut time by throwing it together and not worrying that all your shadows are facing the right way. As academics who want to engage with the public, it adds more time into our work day. Right. If you're on the tenure track, of course public service is a slice of that pie chart, but we really know what the universities are looking for. They're looking for research, research, grants, 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 research, when you're up for your tenure case. So as much as they might say public engagement is valued, we kind of get a different response from them when we put a lot of time into public engagement. So to do it, you need to value it yourself and do it because you want to. But in order to kind of maintain your academic career, it's good to find ways to do it efficiently. And so bad graphics is one. I'm not trying to create a coffee table book with any of my visual aids. I'm just trying to get my point across. The other reason why I really like using bad graphics, and probably the most important way, is that they work as bad visual jokes. Right? They stand out as something kind of odd, and it brings the attention back to the talk. As lecturers, we all know that point where eyes are going to glaze over. And when I'm teaching my students, 
I don't really care because I have a lot to get through. They have a bunch of resources in which they can look things up, and they're still responsible to do well on the test. But when I'm talking to a public audience, it is my job to keep them engaged. When we're publicly engaging people with our work, we need to be entertainers as well. And so those graphics just show them that I'm not taking myself too seriously, and it might, make, might get a laugh. That's my goal. Maybe I'll get a laugh. The last reason why I really like using bad graphics is that it keeps my talks fresh. I give the same talk over and over and over again. And so that's one way it's efficient. If I can keep using the same talk, I'm not putting a lot of work into it. But the problem after years of giving the same talk, I just want to shake people. I'm like, why do you not know this already? I've said it a million times. So by creating a little bad graphic each time I give a talk, it keeps me fresh, it keeps me engaged, it keeps me excited to see if I'm going to get the laugh I'm looking for, and it makes me a better presenter when I give that talk. Tip and trick number two, target the kiddos. Wait, we're, really, we're going to use that graphic again? No, I, mean, I put 10 minutes into it, so all right, let's go with it. All right, so tip trick number two, we're going to target the kiddos. Now this is funny because I don't like kids. I just don't. I don't get them. I don't know how to talk to them. They don't like me. But I see the value in interacting with them. And so I'm very engaged in all of our university STEM days or alumni days where people bring their kids. I participate in other summer camps run outside of the school. And the reason I do it is because although I am rapidly aging, I still remember what it was like to be a kid. And I remember the things that stuck with me when I was a kid. For instance, when I was five years old, I learned from the late, great Whitney Houston that the children are our future. Teach them well, let them lead the way. And no joke, when I was five, I'm like, preach it. I did not think she was talking about me. I'm like, we got to teach the kids. Like, that's how I felt, and I still feel that way. It is important. The children are our future. So the reason I engage with kids is because the scale of impact is greater. The things I learned as kids still affect me, when I was a kid, still affects me today. And so things I really remember from being a kid is when somebody would come from the outside and come to the classroom. Right? Because you get sick of listening to your teachers or your parents. And we still do it as an adult. Like My husband can tell me the same thing all the time, and then somebody else comes in. I'm like, that's a great idea. Right? We do it all the time. And so it's the same with kids. Be that person that comes in from the outside. Be that expert testimonial. To this day, I remember somebody coming in and telling us about conserving resources. And ever since then, I have never let the water run while I brush my teeth. Right? That still affects me today. But it also made me realize that I can affect the planet. I can do things. And so I remember that, and that's what I try to get to with teaching kids and reaching out to them. The other great thing about kids is that they don't have the same biases and disgusts that their parents have. So when it comes to edible insects, I, it took me years to overcome the bias. Like It still can be hard for me to eat a bug. And I studied it for a year. So if somebody doesn't want to eat a bug, I'm like, it's fine. You don't have to. Because I understand the, the, the cultural stigma that you're trying to overcome in that moment. I don't expect after a half hour of me talking, you're all of a sudden going to change. But your kids don't have that yet. And actually, the things that gross us out intrigue them. Right? So they are actually more curious by the things that are disgusting. The other thing I want to mention about engaging with kids, and it also comes from another memory from when I was in elementary school, is that I remember dissecting owl pellets. I was so proud that my owl pellet had a whole mouse skull in it. And undoubtedly, that has affected my path to where I am today. And so we can bring that to kids. We don't have to be only talking about the things that we are experts on. We're biological anthropologists. We know about digging bones out of stuff, right? So we can teach an owl pellet class. We don't need to be the expert in owls or the rodents they eat. But just showing up, being that expert from the outside. If you have grad students, make them do it, right? There are teachers that would love an afternoon off and have you come in and show, your ki show their kids how to do things. And so that's the other thing is that, yes, I do a lot of engagement on edible insects, but I do a lot of things that I'm not necessarily an expert on because I know a lot more than those kids, and that's often all you need to do to engage with them.
Tip and trick number three, talk to your allies. There are a lot of lifelong learners out there. As academics, we've made a career on it, but there are a lot of people who just want to learn. And maybe they get that from YouTube, and that doesn't make them any less eager or any less smart than us. And so reaching out to them is just as effective, and actually it can go a lot further. Most often these are people that believe in evolution, but they might not be as up to date on the mechanisms and processes or know how to discuss it with their friends and families. And so this is a great target for us. If we can talk to these people who are just lifelong learners and want to be our advocates, we should definitely do that. Some of the most rewarding outreach I have done is speaking at sci-fi and fantasy conventions. These are my people. I know how to speak their language. I'm a geek just like them. And so I can use metaphors and references to my little slice of pop culture, and they'll get it, and they'll laugh, and they'll engage with it. I can quote Tyrion Lannister to my students, and they might get it, but they kind of have this sort of uncomfortable thing like, oh, she likes Game of Thrones too? I don't know how I feel about my crazy professor who eats bugs also liking the same show I like. So using pop culture references never really works for me in the classroom, and it makes me sad because I love doing it. So getting to the sci-fi fantasy conventions has been great. I get to use all of this. And the wonderful thing is there's often these tracks for authors. So think of a sci-fi author. Sci-fi is to take scientific principles and just kind of bend them or think about them and what it's going to look like in the future. And, and we have these panels where we kind of offer the science to the authors, and then they use it as inspiration in their writing. And so I've spoken on topics of what will the food look like 3,000 years from now? What, would, what could we eat on Mars besides the potatoes we see in the Martian? I've also talked about, for kind of the fantasy side, what would, how, how would mystical beasts reproduce? Right? So these are things that I get to engage with and because they want to use real science in their writing. They want it to be believable, and I get to contribute to that. But the best part is that I get to have a panel on edible insects, and then afterwards, I get to talk to people about how insects are used in elixirs in Breath of the Wild, or why don't they eat more bugs in The Walking Dead? Oh, come on, Daryl ate like one bug. He ate an earthworm, and it was like presented in the like, Daryl's crazy, and he eats a possum and such. It was not, no, it, George, right, Georgia is in the south. It's like the tropics of the United States. There's tons of bugs. I don't know. I don't know why I didn't eat more bugs. Anyways. But those are the conversations I get to have, right? Because now all of a sudden, I get to point out these things, these inconsistencies, or how we just inadvertently speak bad about eating bugs without even realizing it. And I get to engage a whole audience with the kind of the pop culture surrounding edible insects. Tip and trick number four. When in doubt, show a chimpanzee clip. As biological anthropologists, we're advocates for the rights of non-human primates. And it is important for us to do that and to say that primates are terrible pets and that they should not be used in movies or TV or commercials, right? And it's important for us to say that. However, we can use the same tricks as Hollywood because, gosh darn it, watching primates is really fun. And so we can use videos of them in their natural habitat and then use that as our opportunity and our platform. Like, these are great. Shouldn't we save them? Shouldn't we conserve their environments? And they're terrible pets. And that's one way you can ruin their habitat and how they live their lives. So don't make them pets, but we can learn so much from watching them. So chimp videos are my go-to. If I'm a little worried that my audience might not be there, I slip in a chimp video. And for me, it's great because Chimpanzee tool use, especially, is amazing. It is hard to watch them and not realize how closely related we are to them. They solve problems, and they've built an entire culture around eating bugs nonetheless. And so for me, it's an excellent tool to engage the public with our work. But you can use any primate video and any topic, and they're popular on BuzzFeed, for a reason, because people enjoy them. So let's use them and teach with them as well. So those are my tips and tricks. They're mostly for going out and speaking, but there are lots of ways to engage with the public. But hopefully these might 
help you think about how you might do your next talk, or maybe give you a little more confidence to go out and show people what we do. Because the more people know what we do, the more scientific literacy there's going to be and the better future everyone's going to have. Thank you. <laughs>